Yes. All right. Our next speaker in the segment is Jenks from Partner Solutions Lead at Linktree. He is an API fanatic and AI geek. Previously before Linktree, he has been as a developer evangelist at Zero. Hello, Jenks. Hello, Satya. How are you? Good morning. How are you? Good I'm morning. good. Thank you. Lovely. Should I start? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So we all love to be part of communities, be it social or professional. But uh, Jenks here is going to give us some tips and tricks to start tech communities, isn't it? Yes. Wonderful. Looking forward to it, Jenks. Stage is yours. Thanks. Hello, Kong Hong, API Hong Kong. What's up? Uh, today, I'm here to talk about how to start a tech community. Uh, first of all, a little bit about myself and why you're listening to me. My name is Jenks. I'm a tech author. I used to be a developer evangelist. Um, I also run a startup uh, meetup called Developer Relations Australia. I'm the organizer there, co-organizing with a few people there. Uh, I'm also a community geek. Uh, through my last job, I get to work in a community of 70,000 developers uh, who are building really innovative stuff. Uh, so I really love my job uh, over there. And that was a very good experience. Uh, I got into community. I'm huge, hugely passionate about it. A little bit about my company, Linktree, currently. Uh, this is a, a company that's very innovative as well. Uh, we're solving a problem that a lot of people haven't realized yet. The internet is very widely fragmented these days. If you're an influencer, if you're trying to create something, some content online, like I write articles, um, you're probably dealing with 10 to 20 different platforms on a daily basis for your digital presence. Now, Linktree provides a really simple solution to that, which is uh, aggregating all of those things into a very dynamic uh, personal landing page. Uh, and so you can divert your traffic from anywhere uh, from here. It can go a little bit deeper. We're trying to get into the uh, commerce space. So we have integration with uh, PayPal and Square. So you can finish transactions there and not just use it as a uh, place to link off to other places. We're growing at a crazy rate. Uh, we have 40 million active users, growing at about 30,000 signups per day. Uh, our customers are very diverse. We have music industries, but also 250 other uh, verticals that's uh, joining daily. Uh, from a visitor side, the traffic that we create is about 50, 500 million uh, views per month, where we have a good ranking on Alexa, uh, which is a site that is used for, to measure domain traffic. 30% of our users are in US, and uh, uh, on average, every hour, there's about 5,000 links created. So my talk today is about how to start a tech community. I'm very passionate about this topic, tech community. Um, I think for many businesses, having a user community is a great way to differentiate themselves from competitors, from their competitors. Um, this will add value to their products and make users uh, more sticky. They can feel the gradual flattening sign-up curve and hopefully uh, have a little bit more exponential growth with word of mouth. A community also brings brand loyalty, product evangelism, people advocating for your product and solidifies your growth. As more and more companies are transforming to, to platform business, not just the product, but platform business where other businesses can build on top of it, the technical members of those community really stands out um, the technical community are communities too, but they deserve a different kind of attention. This talk will discuss how to start a successful and vibrant tech community, uh, or in some context, it's called developer community. So how do a tech community differ from a normal user community? Um, they're different. If you, think, uh, if you think about it, like user community sometimes can be very harsh. Uh, and tech community developers are even harsher. There's a lot of uh, keyboard warriors in there uh, in, a, in a in dev circle. Uh, they're short on time usually. They don't like long engagements. If you start to have one hour uh, videos and all that, they will turn off. Um, they're anti-marketing, anti-sales. They can smell that very quickly. Uh, but they're the ones who create most value for your users. So it could be plugins, extensions, or some kind of integration, API integration that they create that is highly valuable and makes your user want to stay with your product. They join your community because they usually run into issues and need help from others uh, or from you directly. 
And they can tell in seconds if a community is not active, so they can smell the staleness very quickly and see if legit, legitly people are contributing in this community. They like to attend events uh, not for the fun of it. Uh, they like to attend events to better their skills, upskill, and become superhuman or super devs. And they um, they usually don't want to buy things. So tech community managers has uh, has this kind of different challenge than normal community managers. Um, you need to be honest. You need to be clear with your messages because they don't have time. Um, you need to provide useful information. Sometimes quick no is very useful for developers. No, my API is not able to do that, uh, like the mirror just talked about. Uh, you need to be very clear on the use cases of your products and say, no, that doesn't cover that, or yes, it's definitely going to help you to do that. Um, and you need to be very, very authentic uh, and create a very loud voice when you want to make some announcements. So don't create a community, find one. Oh, if, you're, if you just got hired as a community manager, and here you go, create a dev community, your boss says, you should probably start looking for a new job because, because it's incredibly hard to forge a community without already having uh, some form of community uh, already. Or you need massive amount of investment to be able to grow a community um, not naturally. Even if one managed to build a community from scratch, it doesn't really justify the value of it. Uh, so return is going to be enough, not going to be enough for the business. It's not the case of you build it, it will come. It needs to evolve from the existing user base. So do your research before you're starting. Observe how users interact with other, others currently. Speak to a few hardcore fans of your user base. Find out some insights, such as what language, what programming language would they like to use? Where, where do they find new technologies? Where do, you, where do they want to find out about product releases and interesting news about your product? Uh, what are the common traits of them? Some users might already started their community without you knowing. Um, should you tap into that, their community or just um, collaborate with them? Um, sometimes there will be local meetups or tech conferences that's already there. So make a decision on investing in uh, tech communities or join the existing ones. Uh, I have an example. I used to work for Zero, and I interface with uh, quite a few developers on a daily basis. Uh, there's uh, a zero. There's 2.2 million businesses using accounting software, their accounting software SaaS, and they managed to make uh, accounting software uh, very interesting and sexy to to use. So they have a huge user community there. People love them. Accountants and bookkeepers and also uh, small businesses love them. Uh, the dev community is also very very vibrant. There's about 70,000 of them. They create a place for them. Um, start in the right ways. Uh, no one wants to set up a tech community for failure. Uh, you probably think you won't need any guidance. You can let the community grow. That's true to some extent. But doing it right early on can really save you a lot of time. So one of the leadership 101 principles is uh, don't use a number for your company's vision or mission. Uh, such as reaching X billions of uh, users by 2030, or we want to produce so many millions of products by a certain time. Uh, why? Because employees don't really want to work for a number. They want to wake up and work for a cause, for a good cause beyond the numbers. Running a tech community is quite similar to that. We need to respect that rule that people have. Community members don't come in to join your mem uh, membership because it looks pretty, uh, but they should be here for a good reason. Uh, they, the value proposition to them needs to be very clear. So to set a mission and vision for your community and make sure everyone who joins understand where you're going with this community and what they're here for. A couple of good examples are here. Our mission is to ensure internet is a global public resource, open and accessible to all. That's from Firefox Developer Forum. Another one, uh, employee experience platform to design, help people connect, focus, learn, and thrive at work. That's from Microsoft Tech Community. That's their purpose. So community is a place where you use a gather and share ideas. Setting a gathering place is important, but what should it be? Like in what format should it be, be in? Some communities can exist completely online uh, with tools like Slack, Discord, web forum, in other in other companies, communities uh, has to be in-person events like meetups, rock shows, and sometimes conferences. One of the simplest ways to run a community is just to set up an email list and email them once in a while. Setting a good 
cadence for gathering is some defining and some defining ritual to bring stability to the community is good. Uh, what what would be think about what would that be on an ongoing basis? Could it be Tips Tuesday fortnight to catch up, or you can ask the, ask something uh, once a month. You can have something once in, once a month, or have regular contests or uh, publish contents like blogs, videos, webinars, uh, published to achieve the same effect. Whatever event you host. Uh, or content you create, encourage people to share on social, design them to go viral, and have a good cadence. Governance is important. Free speech is also important. Um, after all, community is a place for like-minded people to gather. The good behaviors that can help uh, communities to grow, you need to encourage. But what if someone behaves badly? A lot of people say community is a mess because of some bad players. Uh, do, do bad players need to be punished? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, governance is important to grow a healthy community. Before you make community public and welcome people in, with open arms, you need to make sure that you have a set of code of conduct, community guidelines, or principles published so you can set up some tones and values of the community. For example, diversity and inclusion is an important one. Make a list of things that you have zero tolerance on, like racism or hate speech. When you face a bad actor, refer to code of conduct, principles, and guidelines can make you feel uh, really, really good and also help the community to grow. Governance exists because we want community to be engaging, a place to create good content and a safe place to get together. There will always, always be a few members in the community uh, to be ultra active than others. If you spot a few, don't ignore them or treat them as freaks. Do the opposite, embrace it. They're passionate individuals about your community for a good reason. Find out why and embrace it. I like communities who hold their advocates, ambassadors, and champions proud, uh, have a hall of fame of list with their names on it, uh, give the community leaders some shout outs, kudos from time to time. Sometimes it's useful to have a board community, committee uh, for the leaders of the community uh, to, to make them really heard or help you to make some decisions uh, with where the community is going. Other times, an ambassador program can give you the attention and recognition you need. Crediting and recognizing existing members is a good way to give back to the community that create a value for you. A successful example is All Zero Ambassador Program. They have attracted more than 100 uh, ambassadors in various regions and evangelized their product to communities in their own languages in that region. If you were to run this program, it will probably cost you tens of millions of dollars, uh, but they have a really good system to do it, uh, do it very efficiently. So having said about some people may not be able to afford an advanced program, it takes some effort to set it up. As software companies, sometimes it's uh, smart to open up parts of your code public uh, for contribution. For example, your SDK tools, uh, collaborate with community members, these are tech companies, uh, and there are some open source tech, tech companies out there. Uh, open source communities deserve another level of special care because they are very, very different from just general dev communities. Open source communities engage frictionless entry. They want to be in there without having to submit a form, get approval, or something like that. But it doesn't mean that you don't need to design the communication channels and contribution processes. Expanding basic things like how users can communicate with the maintainers, how often pull requests are getting reviewed, whether there are mentors they can reach out to when they get stuck, uh, or how do they help get more help if they want to, to collaborate with others. Just making repository public on GitHub.com or GitLab.com is the first step. Nothing's going to happen if you don't decide on how to make decisions in the community, in this open source community. You need, do you want to run a company-led development open source project? Uh, or is it like a benevolent dictatorship kind of thing? I um, mean, strong leadership to one person? Or do you have a governing board model and have more democ democratized way to do this? Now, having a gov governance model can avoid many conflicts and frustrations you might cause uh, to smart minds who are eager to work on your project. It frustrates developers if they're not clear on how decisions are made and why. Getting licensed is also important, keeps you out of jail, and also um, also get you out of a lot of uh, legal discussion down the lane. Open source development does not attract more legal issues. Uh, closed product have just as much as legal issues as well. But setting that 
uh, that license right at the beginning will have uh, will have you covered for most of the things. Open source community is and community in general is not a sprint. It should be a long term investment. So some as a summary, as a software company, sometimes it's smart to as, so as a summary, um, open source communities, sorry, tech, technical communities have to emerge from existing user base. They can't be created without out of seeing error. Technical users have different needs than other communities. So they require different kinds of attention. To make it healthy, you'll need to start in the right way, set to the right value, create rituals, codes, guidelines, embrace the champions, and prepare to go with the flow. There might be changes coming. If you're an open source community, define right ways of working, governance model, set licenses, and make make sure it's a long-term investment, not a one-time project. So I hope my talk can help you to start your tech community right from day one. Many of my ideas actually came from community building, um, building from wonderful this book called uh, The Business Value of Developer Relations by Mary Semfeld. Have a read, it will be really good. I didn't know I can put in HR announcements here. So we are actually uh, crazily hiring for a lot of talents, de developer talents here. So I'll say like Linktree is hiring good devs. So please come on board, contact me if you want. Thanks. Good. Thanks, Jinx. And thanks for your HR pitch as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, OK, so in terms of uh, questions, what are the two key challenges you normally face after starting a tech community? Uh, like, how do you keep it active and going? Constant, so constant engagement with the uh, community is needed on a daily basis. Um, in the company that I used to work for, it's a joint effort between API product team, uh, product managers, support team, and also developer evangelist. Whoever has the capacity here and there to answer questions, they will jump into the community forum, Stack Overflow, or uh, sometimes on, on chats directly with partners uh, to resolve their questions quickly. Uh, I think what could be done better is uh, to have a, some kind of a management measurement on the overall uh, engagement that people have. I know there's a company called, uh, uh, this company in Hong Kong, I forgot their name here, but uh, they do this kind of a community cockpit design and you can, you can suck all the uh, engagement data from different channels that you engage. I think, yeah, to, to keep it alive, you need to be engaged. The company people need to be engaged, and you need to design the content to also uh, be engaging between developers. Yeah. Uh, and is the community manager role a full-time role, in your opinion? Yes, it should be a full-time role, because uh, <laughs> it's quite demanding. Um, yeah. Sometimes the conversation doesn't go so well, well, and post and threads replies can, can blow up. And that's when you know there is an issue in our product feature or decision that we have made. Uh, that's that's valuable because you wouldn't normally get that if you don't have a community to capture that. It's likely to go into your support queue. It's likely to yep. go into your your sales queue and all that. Yeah. So it's a uh, it, it's very demanding, and I think it should be a dedicated role here. Wonderful, uh, interesting presentation, Jinx, and great ideas. Thank you so much for coming along. Thanks. Bye.